we sit at a table delightfully spread and teeming with good things to eat and daintily finger the cream-tinted bread, just kneading to make it complete. A film of the butter so yellow and sweet, well suited to make every minute a dream of delight. And yet while we eat, we cannot help asking, what's in it? The wine which you drink never heard of a grape, but of tannin and coal tar is made and you could not be certain, except for their shape, that the eggs by a chicken were laid. And the salad, which bears such an innocent look and whispers of fields that are green, is covered with germs, each armed with a hook to grapple with liver and spleen. The banquet, how fine, don't begin it, till you think of the past and the future and sigh. How I wonder, how I wonder, what's in it? Harvey Wiley. In 1901, government chemist Harvey Washington Wiley set out to prove that Americans were being poisoned by an ever increasing number of new chemical preservatives secretly being added to their food. Wiley had been on a public crusade for two decades to force the government to regulate the powerful new food manufacturing industry when he struck upon a novel approach to raise awareness, human trials. What Wiley wanted to find out is if you eat enough of this, will it kill you? It created public awareness for people to begin to question what was in their food and I think more importantly, question these large corporations. America was definitely the Wild West for putting all kinds of chemicals into food. It was completely unregulated. Any producer could get away with whatever they wanted. Before Wigley, there was nobody testing to see whether something was harmful or not. Wiley became the face of the pure food movement that was sweeping the country mobilizing legions of activists allied in a fight for basic human rights that came to define the progressive era. And this man's course in life was to make food safe, making sure that the poorest among us could go to the store and get food that wasn't going to kill them. Wiley's controversial experiments captivated and even entertained the country and his volunteers earned the nickname the Poison Squad. Their sacrifice helped lead to the passage of the first consumer protection laws in American history. The Poison Squad was one of the most influential scientific studies of the 20th century. This is the first federal attempt to regulate the quality and adulteration of food. In a very real way, he's the father of the FDA. In 1881, 37-year-old chemist Harvey Wiley was working in relative obscurity in the lone laboratory on the campus of Purdue University. Wiley had become fixated on the analysis of food products, perfecting techniques for identifying and isolating their various chemical components. Earlier that year, the Indiana State Board of Health had asked Wiley to examine the purity of commercially sold honey and maple syrup. Wiley collected samples from across the state. Much to his surprise, his analysis revealed up to 90% of them were fake.
most of the jars labeled honey were just tinted corn syrup with a scrap of honeycomb thrown in to complete the deception. At the turn of the century, people would buy honey and it was usually corn syrup. People would buy maple syrup and it was usually corn syrup. People would buy jam and it was usually corn syrup. You had no idea what was in your jar of jam. You had no way to know that because there was no labeling on these foods either. Wiley takes all of these samples and finds hugely widespread fraud across the board in all of these products. And basically comes out and says, if this is true in Indiana alone, we know it's true everywhere. So this is a national problem and this is not acceptable. Wiley's interest in the new field of food chemistry was happening at a moment of unprecedented change in the way Americans ate. By the late 19th century, the country was in the midst of a second industrial revolution. Great advances in technology allowed for the expansion of all types of industry, from steel manufacturing and coal mining to communication and railroads. Trains now moved people and produce at a pace and distance never imagined, radically reshaping the American landscape. No facet of life went untouched by the great economic transformation, including the American diet. Cities swelled as millions of new laborers began working in factories. The nation's efforts to feed them sparked a boom in the new field of industrial food manufacturing. Post-Civil War, you start seeing a migration to the city and away from people who are living in the farm fresh communities. So there's more and more people, more and more food has to be manufactured. The biggest purely economic development is the rise of big business. You get Pillsbury, you get Heinz, Campbell's, Nabisco, all these big food companies emerge at this time. With industrialization came consolidation. Midwestern cities grew into major food manufacturing hubs where everything from wheat, corn, and livestock could be processed. By 1890, Chicago's Union stockyards were processing over 9 million head of cattle a year. And by the turn of the century, meatpacking behemoths like Swift and Armour were providing nearly 90% of the country's processed meat. Rather than moving food from the area surrounding a city to the city, you know, you can grow your beef out in the Midwest. You can process it in Chicago, and you can bring it down into New York City, all through railroads at fairly low cost. The slaughterhouses of America created the notion of an assembly line. When Henry Ford came up with the assembly line for the Model T, it was inspired by the slaughterhouses in Chicago, which were applying all kinds of new notions of efficiency to food production. 